Hello, and welcome to the Air and Space Live Chat. I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM and 30, an Emmy-nominated TV show for middle school students. And today we have a great show for you. We are going to be talking about a pole-to-pole -pole flight, and we want you to participate. Let us know where you're watching from. We'll be giving shout outs throughout the show. And if you're watching with a class, let us know that too. We would love to give teachers shout outs during the show. Also, let us know what questions you have. We've got a couple of great guests that are ready to answer your questions. Put them down in the comments section and we'll, we will get to as many of them as we can. Now, like I mentioned, today's show is all about a pole to pole flight. So let's learn a little bit more about this amazing journey. The essence of adventure and exploration is certainly found in both the destination and the journey. In early November 2019, I set out from San Diego, California in a twin turbine Commander 900 to attempt a pole-to-pole -pole aviation first in an aircraft of this type. The journey comprises 26 nations across six continents. I'm also the first pilot to utilize only biofuels over the poles, and I'm carrying two state-of-the-art experiments from NASA and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. One represents the future of space travel, and the other tests for atmospheric plastic pollutions across the globe. All right, now today we have something new that we are trying on this live chat. We're going to try a poll, and we're doing it on this show so that we can do a poll to poll poll. See what I did there? <laughs> I am looking forward to this today. As we try this poll to poll poll, we will populate this on Facebook. You'll have an opportunity to, to play along with us. And then a few minutes later, we will go back and see what your answers are. So to get us started today, let's bring in Robert De Laurentiis, who did this pole to pole flight, as well as National Air and Space Museum aeronautics curator, Dorothy Cochran. Dorothy and Robert, thank you both for joining us today. Hi, great to be here. Thanks for having us. All right. So like I said, let us know where you're watching from and put those questions down in the comments section. Robert, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about this amazing flight. You know, it was the most ambitious and inspired, I think, journey of my life. And I really wanted to go out into the world with the help of my friends, supporters, 95 of the best sponsors ever, and try and be a, a living example for the change I wanted to see in the world. And it brought together my three passions, uh, flying, spirituality, and business. And, you know, along the way, we carried some very, very important science, the NASA wafer scale spaceship which we have a visit from today. Um, also the plastic particle experiment and the biofuels experiment over the pole. And during the course of the eight months and 23 days, we filmed a 10 part docu-series interviewing people about what it means to be a citizen of the world. And the thing that was really interesting was it didn't matter who we interviewed. It could be a dog sled musher out of Argentina, a ballerina from Bulgaria, Eric Lindbergh from Seattle, or a Zulu Ranger from South Africa. Everybody wanted the same thing. They valued family and they wanted safety, financial security, health, happiness, joy, and peace. And, you know, most importantly, this was a peace mission. We connected the South Pole and the North Pole, the two places where peace has always existed on the planet. And we like to think that we brought people together because we had them focus on these important things that we all share. And we found that there are more similarities than differences amongst people along the way. Awesome. And, you know, you mentioned this pole to pole and connecting the world. We have folks from all across the United States and the world tuning in today. We've got North Carolina, Massachusetts, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kansas and Texas, as well as Northern Ireland, the Netherlands, Brazil, India and Canada. So we've got a worldwide audience tuning in today. Thank you all for watching. Keep those shout outs rolling in and let us know what questions you have. Dorothy, my next question is for you. Um, why are stories like Robert's flight so important for the National Air and Space Museum? Well, it's always exciting to see what is next. What are people doing in aviation, aeronautics, space, whatever it may be? There's so many great things that you can do out there. And, and this type of thing is just, first of all, I, I want to congratulate Robert on the flight. And then you just want to find out pushing boundaries. You're pushing boundaries of technology. You're pushing personal boundaries. You're exploring and making discoveries. And we just want to keep up on all those. It's something that, that you know, adds to who we are at the museum to be able to have these as part of, of, of our mission as well. 
Awesome. And just so everybody knows, Dorothy is also a pilot. So we've got a couple of great pilots in with us today. Um, but it's time for our very first poll question. So um, the first question is, what is the furthest that you have ever traveled from home? We know that Robert's gone around the world more than once, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But have you stayed pretty close to home and kept it under 50 miles? Are you at 50 to 100 miles? Have you ventured out up to 500 miles? Or have you gone way over 500 miles? Let us know on that poll that we've populated on Facebook. Now, if you're not on Facebook, if you're watching in a classroom, feel free to talk about this poll with your classmates or if you're at home with your dog, your brother, your mother, and, and uh, you know, see what, what those answers are because sometimes those answers could surprise you. So, Robert, we've, we've, uh, we've talked about your around-the-world flight, so we know that you've gone a long way. Dorothy, what's the furthest you've traveled from home? Well, I've been all the way to Moscow, so I guess that's over 500 miles. <laughs> all right. Well, we will check back on those answers here in just a few minutes, given time to, to come in. And while we wait, we've got folks from Arkansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Missouri watching. And the first question we've got, Robert, is for you. They want to know, did you refuel in the sky? No, the uh, citizen of the world was outfitted with over 50 modifications. And one of those modifications was the installation of six fuel tanks, five of them inside the pressurized compartment of the plane and one in the baggage compartment. This uh, stretched our range from 2,000 nautical miles out to about 5,000 nautical miles. Uh, so the range of the plane was uh, greatly modified and it's a lot of fuel. It became a flying fuel tank, really. And Dorothy, how does that relate to another famous flight from Charles Lindbergh? Well, you know, it's all about picking the right plane for the mission, um, you know, and, and I know that that's what Robert did because he has flown around the world in, in another airplane prior to this. So now he's looking at a, at a different uh, scenario and he wants to pick, pick the right plane and then he needs to outfit it properly. Lindbergh did that as well. You know, he had many options uh, when he was planning his flight. And in the end, none of them really worked. And he went to Ryan uh aircraft company and basically had a custom made plane to what he felt he needed. So, you know, it's an important thing is to get the right plane, know what, you, know what your challenges are. Awesome. Well, we've got folks from Maryland, Florida, Oklahoma, the United Kingdom and Romania all tuning in today. And do us a favor. And as you're watching the show today and you like what we're doing, share this so that the people on your timeline can tune in and ask their questions as well. Um, also, whatever questions you've got, put them down in the comments section. Um, we've got another question here about the biofuels, Robert, and why was it important um, for you to do that over the poles? First of all, because it was the first time that biofuels had ever been used over the North and South Poles. But more importantly, you know, our mission of oneness included the planet, and we wanted to do what we could for a cleaner planet. And certainly if the technology was available, we would have done this using electric or solar power. Um, but that that was not available to us. And we wanted to show the next step in the evolution um, for aviation, which was biofuels. Nice. All right. We've got uh, more questions coming in. Um, Robert, what was one of those awe-inspiring moments from your, from your flight? We know that there were a lot. Can you narrow it down to just one? I'd have to say the South Pole was the most uh, challenging, inspired moment of the flight. You know, so many people came together to make it happen. It wasn't a mission of one. It was a mission of many. And, you know, as Dorothy said, stretching the plane to its absolute and total limits and myself as well. There were so many systems that needed to work perfectly for that flight to happen. Lindbergh had it right. He had a very simple aircraft with the right whirlwind engine, a cloth on the outside and a simple magnetic compass. The citizen of the world had all the latest technology and that really creates issues because there's more that can fail. But talking to uh, Corey at the South Pole, he was uh, operating their comm station. It was a very, very unique feeling. I actually had burned more than half my fuel to get there and I was counting on the fact that the plane would be faster uh, on the way back because it was lighter and also uh, hoping for a tailwind to help push me along. Now, Robert, you mentioned the support crew. Dorothy, can you talk a little bit about support crew and, and other famous flights? Like how important are the, the folks that are not sitting in the cockpit? Well, of course, you've got to manage, you know, where you're going. You've got to know where you're going to be, where you're going to have resources for you. If you have any kind of mechanical issues, uh, fuel stops, 
uh, diplomatic issues, you know, all that sort of thing. You need to have someone who's taking care of those because you're flying the airplane. You've got to be really focused on what your mission is and have other people have these background uh, activities taken care of for you. All right. Well, we've got the results of our very first poll. Let's see what the, the results are. And it looks like almost everybody has traveled over 500 miles. 96% of the folks watching um, had traveled over 500 miles. That is awesome. So we will uh, um, come back to another poll here in a little bit. And if you're one of those folks that had gone over 500 miles, let us know in the comments, what's that furthest destination that you've ever traveled to? Now, Robert, you talked about the, the South Pole and being awe-inspiring from the air. What was the coolest place you got a chance to land? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I liked Karuna, Sweden. It was a pretty uh, beautiful place. Uh, I got to see reindeer. Uh, there's, you know, all kinds of uh, beauty in Sweden and that whole archipelago with the islands. I got to visit some of those. Uh, just breathtaking views. Uh, and, you know, my soul really craved uh, a connection with nature during this trip. So I certainly got a lot of that. Awesome. Uh, we've got somebody that wants to know, um, for both of you, what got you into flying? Dorothy, let's start with you. Well, I actually got into flying after I came to the museum. I was not a pilot um, or anything more than just a casual traveler uh, prior to that. So when I got here, I realized I needed to learn a little bit more about aviation. Um, and I wanted to, and I, and I did enjoy flying. I started flying with friends here and I realized that it was something that I really wanted to do. Robert, how about you? What was that spark? You know, that spark, I think, came as early as I can remember. And I've seen it in other kids, too. When a plane flies by and they, they point up or they look at the plane in the sky, I think it was always an interest of mine. And it was just a matter of really, you know, nurturing that desire. And it started with model airplanes, gas, electric. Eventually, I would build uh, radio-controlled high-performance uh, helicopters and then eventually I got into flying. So it was always with me. And I think a lot of people are born with that desire. It's amazing what that little spark is. Over the weekend, I took my kids on a hike and they were launching model rockets across the street. And these <laughs> things were going up like 5,000 feet. But after going over and seeing one up close, my son came home and he's like, can we build a rocket now, dad? <laughs> like totally into it. And I love seeing that spark. And one of the great things about working at the museum and Dorothy, I'm sure you've seen this is, you know, when those kids get to come and be up close to an airplane, you know, whether it's in a museum or one of our fly-in days, it's incredible to see those expressions. And, and Robert, I know that you've done some outreach with kids. Tell us why this is an important mission for kids. Well, you know, the citizen of the world after this record setting uh, trip, the polar expedition is becoming a, a STEM lab for kids for aviation. And the plane has just gotten a muse museum quality paint job and we have uh, Redbird flight simulators with the South Pole, North Pole, and a leg out of uh, Madagascar programmed in with me sitting in the right seat coaching and encouraging the pilots along. So they're literally going to be able to see the plane, touch the plane, experience the flight, and learn about some of the STEM education uh, experiments that we had along the way, like my little friend Francis here which um, was a NASA funded experiment that we carried on every single leg. And I mentioned earlier, 700,000 pictures were taken by this wafer scale spaceship. So, you know, the plane is rich with science and we're hoping that it will be that spark that helps to inspire people. Dorothy, does it ever get old for you walking in the museum and getting to see some of these amazing aircraft up close? No, that's the beauty of working in the museum. Uh, you know, we, we get to experience it every day and, and just dip in and out of it, at least, you know, when it's open. And, uh, you know, I look forward to that again. But it, and it's just awesome to, to go down and think of the different people and their missions, like Roberts, you know, and what were they up to and, and what was the result of it? And, and then that we know that it's inspirational, then hopefully, at, at least to uh, the rest of the visitors. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got folks watching from all over the country. We've got uh, D.C., Virginia, California, Iowa, New York, Puerto Rico, and Greece is tuning in. Welcome. Let us know what questions you have down in the comment section. We're going to try to get to as many of them as we possibly can today. Um, Robert, in the video earlier, it mentioned that you got sidetracked in Spain because of COVID. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? 
You know, I was actually living in a monastery in Montserrat with a bunch of monks, and I got kicked out <laughs> when uh, COVID hit, and I ended up uh, moving between a few different places. I ended up uh, in a mountaintop retreat called a Zen Villa, and uh, it was actually a, a remarkable time for me. Um, one, because I got to sort of process some of the experiences that I had flying over the South Pole. And, you know, it was a very stressful time. I like to say that it was when I was broken open. And sometimes, you know, we have to deal with these extremely challenging things to sort of open us up to what we're supposed to learn. And I think you enter into a new reality when you're under that level of stress, you know, connecting with nature, doing first time things, exploring being maybe the adventure that your soul always wanted to be. So it really was a time to digest that and, you know, appreciate the, the things that were happening in the world, because even during the great challenges, there are great opportunities. And we saw that as an opportunity to reach out and share our mission that we weren't going to, you know, be stopped. We might be slowed down a little bit, but we were dedicated to accomplishing this mission of peace. Awesome. Well, it's time for our very next poll. And so we'll see the question here in just a second. Would you fly around the world by yourself, whether it's pole to pole or, you know, around the equator? How would, would you take that trip? Yes or no? Let us know on the poll on Facebook and we will reveal those answers here in just a few minutes. And Dorothy, you and I emailed about this the other day. Uh, Dorothy and I both read Zen Pilot uh, Robert's book. And Dorothy, would you take that trip? No, I would not. <laughs> I don't trust myself at all. Um, you know, I, when I put that down, you think about, and I read, I know about other flights too. It's like how many things can go wrong. And Robert really went through the, the ringer on that uh, first round the world flight. And I just, I think my question is, how did you ever get up the the energy and the, and the gumption to do a, a different one? And this one even harder. You know, my uh, first book, which is called Flying Through Life, we talked about pursuing the impossibly big dream. So after that equatorial circumnavigation, we decided we would go one step bigger. What we didn't realize is that the pole to pole flight is enormously more difficult. It took about six months to prepare for that first uh, trip around the equator. Uh, this trip took 18 months. And I'd like to say it was three times harder. And, um, you know, I think some of us, most of us have a restless soul at times and, um, you know, we crave, uh, exploration. We want to learn, we want to travel, we want to meet other people like us. And, you know, sometimes the best way to, uh, really understand what's truly happening in the world is to go face to face with somebody and see that they have all the same desires and interests and likes, just like you do. And that there is truly a human connection. I just like to have somebody else with me, that's all. <laughs> Otherwise, I think it's, it'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know my co-host Beth got a chance to do a uh, an ex exploration flight where she got to fly a very small airplane and she came back after that flight and in no uncertain terms, let everybody know that she will never be getting her pilot's <laughs> license. It was not her thing. And unfortunately, I was not able to go that day. I was out of town, drat. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's see, what's the next question that's coming in? Um, Robert, somebody wants to know, what was the longest leg of your flight? The longest leg of the flight was the South Pole leg from Ushuaia, Argentina to the South Pole and back. And uh, that was about 4,400 nautical miles, which is pretty close to 5,000 miles and uh, extremely difficult. You know, the uh, temperatures were beyond the point of freezing the fuel. So Jet A1 gels at minus 47 Celsius, and I was experiencing minus 60 uh, over the pole. The engines are designed to go as low as minus 53. So we were literally hit, heating the fuel inside the cabin of the plane and then pumping it out. And it's pretty well documented that you lose navigation over the north and south poles. Over the North Pole, I actually lost it for five hours. In addition to my attitude heading and reference, my communications and autopilot. So, you know, you have issues of pilot fatigue, uh, like I said, navigation, uh, snow blindness, because it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference between the clouds and the snow. Uh, that was 18.1 hours that were probably the most challenging of my life. Wow. That's amazing. Um, we've got another question coming in from Jane, who is four. 
and she wants to know, and, and I think this is a good question for both of you, the first part, why do you like to fly? And then there's a follow-up that I'll ask Robert. So Dorothy, why do you like to fly? Well, it's a good challenge. There's no doubt about that. It's always fun to pursue something that's new and, and different. And, and it's just beautiful. I mean, it's the way to see the world. Um, you know, you really understand your geography, a little bit more about social and cultural things as you, as you fly along. And it, it's just beautiful. Robert, how about you? Why do you like to fly? You know, I think it brings together so many things that I enjoy into one moment in time. Certainly the flying uh, is a beautiful experience, connecting with nature, operating the plane is fun, traveling. Uh, when you have people with you, that's pretty exciting as well. So it's like this heightened moment where all the stimulation is coming together uh, at one point. And I did have a person, a mentor of mine, Susan Gilbert, with me through parts of Africa so the whole trip was not solo, but, um, you know, sharing the experience is, is important as well. All right. And Jane has a follow up to that that I think is important that a lot of people are wanting to know. Did you happen to see anybody in a big red suit when you were flying over the North Pole? <laughs> <laughs> Only myself. I was in a uh, bright red neoprene survival suit. I was uh, glued to the window, though, uh, you know, looking for different formations, just any indication of life. And, you know, most of Antarctica is very high. The, the land beneath it is close to sea level, but the actual land is close to 10,000 feet in many, many places. So you would see mountaintops, like pointy mountaintops sticking out of the snow and ice. And then it was just flat for a distance. What you see behind me is just as I crossed the Drake Passage, which is uh, one of the toughest places to fly in the world because of weather and all kinds of different conditions. But that's the Antarctic Peninsula behind me. You can see uh, some of the mountaintops popping through, but just the beauty on a scale that I'd never experienced before. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got the poll results that are in. Let's see how everybody voted. Would you fly around the world? And we've got 57% said yes and 43% said not for me. But that's awesome. It looks like we've got a lot of uh, uh, around the world future flyers here. So, Robert, you ready to take them with you on your next trip? You know, I'd love to take them all with me on my next trip. Uh, you know, the plane, the citizen of the world was outfitted with new systems. So, for example, those engines and props behind me uh, the engines are 5,400 hour engines and they have only 300 hours on them now. So there's a lot of adventure left in that plane and, and me as well. That's awesome. Um, we've got a question that, that has come in and I, I and, and actually it's something that I saw in your book, Robert, but I'd like to ask both of you about it. As a pilot, there's always risk with flying. How do you deal with that, with that risk? Dorothy, how do you deal with it? Well, first of all, you hope that you, uh, you know, the plane has been, you know, is in mechanical shape and all of that. And of course, every pilot checks over their plane uh, from the exterior and, and the engine and that sort of thing before they take off. And the main thing that you do is just know your systems and know your procedures. And that's why you practice doing stalls and engine outs or, or you know, different types of scenarios so that you've been through this and you know what the procedures are to get you out of a certain predicament. Robert, how about you? That was actually really well said. Um, I would say the concept of mitigation of risk is a key component to flying. So for this trip, I had my 18 months to sit down and think about every possible risk I could experience. And, you know, uh, identifying those and then taking steps to eliminate them is key. But the thing that was the most challenging that I knew would happen were the risks that I couldn't anticipate. And in my case, you know, a global pandemic was that risk. Um, and, you know, you just do your best to be fluid and uh, adjust. You have the love and support of many, many people, you know, people maybe that are even smarter and more experienced in a lot of different areas than you are. We had an astrophysicist, a guy named Brian Keating. Uh, we had a commercial airline pilot, a guy named Mike Jesh. Uh, there's a guy named Eddie Gould from General Aviation Support Egypt that handled a lot of our uh mission uh, details like permits and that sort of thing. And relying on a strong team, including mechanics, is critical to any flight. All right, Robert, I think the big question that a lot of people want to know is, did you have any close calls on this flight? Oh, my goodness. I think the universe threw everything it had at us. Um, <laughs> 
You know, I, every time I got overly confident, something would happen. And, uh, on the plane, there was 20 valves, six extra fuel tanks. And I thought I sort of had this one under my belt. That's just a partial picture of the valves, but I had misaligned one of them. And, um, two of those aluminum tanks burst inside the plane, dumping about 200 gallons of jet fuel. Uh, it sprayed in one case into my eyes, my face, my chest, my legs, arms, and groin. And uh, I remember falling out of the plane in uh, the car Senegal when that tank burst, just thinking, you know, this is over. And uh, I was throwing water on my eyes and uh, I got that, that, that just motivation that came from inside me and I jumped back in deflected the fuel out of the plane as best I could and tried to save the mission. So yeah, there was countless uh, opportunities to be tested on this trip. And each one of them, I would think, must be preparing me for something bigger. And maybe that bigger is, you know, sharing this with the docuseries, with the book, Peace Pilot to the Ends of the World and Beyond, um, and maybe inspiring people to go out there and pursue their impossibly big dream. And, you know, if if your dream doesn't scare you a little bit, Maybe it's not big enough. That's very, very well said. Um, all right, we've got uh, Norman Surplus is watching today. Um, and I'm, I'm being told that he's circumnavigated in an auto gyro. So uh, thanks, Norman, for, for tuning in and, uh, and for watching. Let us know what questions you have. We've got a few more minutes left, and we'll be getting to our last poll here in just a few seconds. Um, the uh, Let's see. Somebody wants to know, before we get to the poll, have either of you ever flown supersonic? Not I. Not yet. I'm open for opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that Norm Surplus is an amazing guy? He's one of my aviation heroes. He did a trip along the equator in an auto gyro, and that guy is brave on a scale that I don't think I'll ever be. <laughs> I, Great guy. I, brave is one term for it. I'm not sure. <laughs> Dorothy, tell us what an auto gyro is. I think I've got a picture in my mind, but for our audience, tell us what an auto gyro is. Well, it's not a helicopter. It's not an airplane. It's it, it's just, you know, it's got a rotor and, and a very small engine, and it just kind of, you know, goes up vertically, and you, and you tool along at a low level. There's no cockpit. I mean, it's really, it's really uh, out there. That's all I can say. <laughs> you should Google it. When I've seen them before, it, it and I know that it's more complex than this, but it kind of looks like a a lawn chair strapped to a helicopter blade. Basically, um, yeah. Wings, and, and so if the poll question were for me on that, it would be a big, big <laughs> no on that. Yeah. But Norman, thank you for, for watching today. I hear he's uh, chatting around in the comments there, so we appreciate that. Um, let's go to our last poll for today, and we want to know which would you rather visit, the North Pole or the South Pole? Again, if you're on Facebook, that poll will pop up on your screen. And if you're not on Facebook, talk about it with your class or near someone with you, or even write down the answer and mail it to us at the National Air and Space Museum. We'd love to see that. Um, Dorothy, which one would you rather visit? Oh, I'd love to go to the South Pole. I think there's, uh, you know, I, I've, I've done some research. Uh, we have um, Bird's plane, Richard Bird, uh, and, uh, you know, he was the first one to fly over the South Pole with Floyd Bennett, and we've got the stars and stripes from that ex expedition. So I would, I'd love to kind of follow in that. That sounds awesome. All right, we've got uh, more questions coming in. Um, Robert, somebody wants to know about navigation and mainly GPS around the poles. How did that work or did it get messed up? You mentioned losing communication for a while. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, basically, I had multiple redundant systems and you shift from magnetic to true when you get a distance from the poles. Um, the problem though is uh, a GPS unit generally can't calculate the point where all the meridians meet, taking let's say the South Pole, for example. So typically you'll shut those systems off. Mine failed over the South Pole for about 30 minutes, over the North Pole for five hours. And surprisingly, the system that worked was the Apple iPad. And the reason why it worked is because it was picking up Russian GLONASS satellites on the horizon. And different equipment is set at a different angle, you know, to measure the satellites. And apparently, uh, some of the stuff in the cockpit was at uh, the incorrect angle. So, you know, a thousand pound or a thousand dollar iPad is what got me home when I was five hours from land over the North Pole and certainly even more remote over the South Pole. That's amazing. Um, 
I have a quick question. Um, and You're supposed to be answering questions, Dorothy. I know, but I want to know. Uh, what did you see from the air environmentally? I mean, is what was the most remarkable thing or, or, or tenuous thing that you saw? Well, you know, um, pilots certainly fly in instrument flight conditions where you have no vision out of the cockpit. So everything better than that, I was happy to see with my eye. Um, you know, I, I think just the clarity of the air over the South Pole, like you can see it behind me. It was kind of like somebody turned the volume up on just the visual you were seeing. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can answer that one completely for you. I would just say that, you know, in the most remote parts of the planet where there's fewer pollution or there's less pollution and less interaction with humans, uh, the scenery just increases on an exponential scale. It's beautiful. Robert, can you talk a little bit about the the other experiment that you took on your flight with you? Sure. It's a Scripps Institute of Oceanography plastic particle experiment. And they found plastics, microfibers, which are in our clothes, all over the surface of the planet, including at the South and North Poles. They've also found it in the water in some of the most remote parts of the planet. So this was the first experiment that tested for plastic particles in the air over the poles and all the way around the planet. And the way we did it was we used a piece of sticky tape that I actually got at uh, Home Depot. And it was placed on top of a piece of duct tape so it could be peeled off easily. And for each leg, I would place the duct tape and the double-sided uh, plastic tape. And what would happen is as I would fly through the air, it would collect particles and then they would dissolve that in the lab and determine what particles were there. And when I was stuck in Spain, one of the ways we were able to get out of there is we contacted the Spanish government and said, hey, we can test for COVID in the air if you allow us to leave now at the height of the pandemic. And, you know, in the interest of science, they allowed us to go and we're awaiting results for that right now. That's amazing. And I love the, the piece of tape because it it just illustrates that you don't have to have multi-million dollar equipment. You have to have the really good ideas to do good science. I think that's awesome. Dorothy, as a curator in the aeronautics department, are there any other kind of cool experiments or, or scientific things that you've seen on other aircraft? Well, this I was just going to say that relates directly to Lindbergh uh, flying. Uh, when he and Ann Lindbergh were flying in uh, 1931 and 33 in our Lockheed Sirius, the Tingma Sartok, they had a spore collector on the outside of the plane. And it's basically like that. It was just a sticky tape that they could slide in and out of a tube. And he was collecting spores as they went around the world and then brought them back and uh, wrote up a little scientific piece uh, with some folks, uh, scientific people, um, you know, about what's in the air. And this was back in the 1930s. So it's, it, it's directly, you know, it's just the same. That is absolutely awesome. Well, we've got our poll results. Let's see where folks wanted to go, to the North or the South Pole. Wow, more wanted to go to the South Pole, 65% to 35%. That is awesome. Well, if you get a chance to go to the South Pole and that spark came from today, let us know. We want to know all about that. Um, Thank you all for participating in those polls. That's been kind of a fun experiment for us today. Um, it's all new, and so we're trying some new things. So I appreciate all the folks that are in the background making those polls happen. Um, somebody, Now, Robert, this is probably the most important question that we've had on the whole chat today. Somebody wants to know what you ate while you were on your flight. <laughs> I, you know, I ate a lot of different things. Uh, water actually was key to stay hydrated, hydrated because that's a really dry part of the planet when you're over the South Pole, believe it or not. I had nuts, I had raisins, um, I had chocolate. The uh, bed and breakfast that I stayed in uh, in Ushuaia had some amazing soup, and I asked them to pack some of that up for me. Um, yeah, just normal food that I would eat, and um, I always had something sweet because I wanted to sort of. Uh, eat, well, I wanted to raise my attention level when I was landing. So I needed something with caffeine and a little bit of sugar to help me at that moment when you're the most tired and you really need to be 100% on. Nice. And if you want to find out what stealth pilots use to, to make sure that they stay awake on, on long flights, check out our last live chat about stealth. Um, let's see. Now, Robert, you used a word. Um, oh, actually, that's my last question that I want to ask. You said in your, in your book, Zen Pilot, um, the lessons don't stop when we embark on our journey. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, you know, 
everybody sees, you know, challenges happening in the world. And when we go out into the world by ourselves on uh, what they call the hero's journey, there are these things that happen to us. And, you know, you could look at it in the way that you go, oh, wow, that was really tough. I'm getting beaten down. You know, it's cosmic torture. Or you could say, you know, the universe is teaching me this lesson. And from those challenges come the lessons. So, you know, when you go out and expose yourself to these these opportunities and challenges and adventures, um, that's when the learning really begins. And I, I wrote a blog about that, that when you're at that critical breaking point, you open yourself up to a new reality that you don't experience in your daily life. So adventures like this are really great opportunities to learn. Awesome. And, and you used a word in your book that I had never seen before. And, and I thought it was a really interesting word. It's IntelliKey, um, E-N-T-E-L-E-C-H-Y. And it's the realization of potential. I had to go look it up to make sure I knew what I was talking about. But I, I think that's really interesting. And, and can you talk a little bit about that? And then, Dorothy, I've got a follow-up for you on that. And you, you said that perfectly, too. It is IntelliKey. Think about an acorn becoming an oak tree. You know, there's all that um, potential that's in the acorn and it's so small, you know, like a child growing up, but they, they bloom or blossom or grow into the person that they will become. And I think the sort of the DNA in that acorn is what defines our lives, what we will become. So I think, you know, my little uh, acorn shell or, or seed had this desire to go out into the world and fly. And it's important to listen to that. You know, a lot of people say, Oh, I've always thought about flying. Um, but if that's there, it's something probably worth pursuing. And Dorothy, when did that, when did it dawn on you that, that becoming a historian and a curator is something that, that would be a good fit for you? Well, probably when I was in college, I mean, I always enjoyed history and, uh, you know, I got there and I say, well, what am I going to do with this? And, and I, I was a teacher briefly, but I, I really discovered that I wanted to, I'd been to museums and I wanted to, to do more research and, and learn about more history and, and present it and, you know, be part of, of the presentation of it and, and discovery of it. Awesome. Well, Dorothy and Robert, thank you both so much for joining us today. This has been a great chat. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I would like to thank everybody watching for participating in our polls today. And I want to remind everybody that you can find this live chat right now. Go over to Facebook. It's archived there. We will also be posting it on YouTube later today. Um, and we want to remind everybody that to tune in next week. So a week from today is April 1st. And at the National Air and Space Museum, we've done a couple of kind of cool April Fool's videos in the past, including hanging Wonder Woman's invisible jet. Um, this year, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to play Two Truths and a Lie. And Beth and I will be on. We have no idea what's going to happen on this. The way it's going to work is there are three stories that are going to be told from curators at the National Air and Space Museum. Two of them are absolutely true, but crazy wild stories. One of them is completely made up. And Beth and I are going to have to guess and use some of our prior knowledge and some, um, you know, information resources to try to figure out what the, the, uh, the truths and what the lie is. It should be a whole lot of fun. And we want you to participate in that. There will be polls throughout so you can play along with us. And then the following week on April 8th, we will be releasing the next episode of STEM in 30 all about the history and legacy of the space shuttle. And there are a boatload of astronauts that will be appearing on that episode. So that we hope you tune into that. And if you enjoyed this program, be sure to give, give STEM and 30 a follow on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. We're out of time, so thanks for watching, and we hope to see you next time.